Hello. C'est moi, Mystical McKay. How are you guys? I'm doing amazing. I'm so excited to be here and just to read to you. Honestly, I've been looking forward to this all week because I just knew that I was going to do this on Sunday and now I'm excited to just be here and for us to just have this hour or so together just taking in the wisdom that is teal song so thank you for being here with me if you have found the notification and you're on here and you're like yes it's time to read thank you grab some tea get something comfy get all cozy get a blanket why not this is a time for us to just be here together and soak up the wisdom of teal swan so I'm going to log in here on Twitch real quick. Oh, shoot. Let me see. Hold on. For some reason, when I click on this, it doesn't. Here we go. Yeah, I'm live. Cool, cool. That's me. Cool, cool. All right. Sounds good? All right. We're good. Gucci, Gucci, Gucci. Could be a tiny bit louder. Okay. I'll turn up the volume a little bit. Let me know if that's good. I'm trying not to be super close to the mic because I notice when I do my peas, it gets a little poppy. Okay, cool, cool. All right, let's get into it. The chapter for today is chapter three, making the subconscious conscious. I'm really excited about this one. Because honestly, that's the key to living a intentional, happy life is to make the things that you're unconscious of within yourself conscious so that you can consciously choose your life instead of making a bunch of choices from that crazy robot in the back of your mind. Let us begin. Oh my gosh, thank you. I love these new things. Okay. Chapter three, making the subconscious conscious. It's widely known that the behavioral programming of the subconscious mind is acquired during the formative periods between gestation and eight years of age. These life-shaping subconscious programs are a result of observing and interacting with our primary attachment figures within childhood, namely our parents, siblings, teachers, community, and culture. Regretfully, many of our perceptions acquired about ourselves in this formative period are expressed as limiting and self-sabotaging beliefs. But the way we felt during those formative experiences had an even greater effect on us. How early childhood emotions tether us to the past. When we were young and our minds were not fully developed, we didn't think about the world as much as we felt the world. We felt the world before we even saw the world. We felt the world before we could even conceptualize that we live in the world. You came into this earth for the purpose of your own expansion. You knew that doing this would guarantee expansion for the collective as well. You adopted the consciousness level of your parents upon coming into this life. so that you could become the progression of their consciousness and by expansion, your entire line of ancestry. I love that. This is one of the reasons our own cognitive brain function does not fully develop until we are about the age of eight years old. We spend our entire early years, those Whoa. We spend our earliest years, those before the age of eight, essentially, quote-unquote, downloading what beliefs 
and experiences that we came from our family and our culture. During those years, the way that we feel is primarily reactive. This means that we can't think or rationalize our way out of any painful emotions that we feel. And if our traumas remain unresolved, <laughs> they become wounds that last into adulthood. Woo! Trauma! Reflections of ourselves. Once your cognitive mind is developed, you can rationalize your way into thinking whatever makes sense to you. If you were able to rationalize why your father left when you were four years old, you wouldn't feel so badly about it. So, if we have the ability to think our way out of feeling, we would never have quote-unquote downloaded from our primary caregivers any issues that would need to be resolved. But the fact is that we became capable of rationalizing at about age 8 has serious implications. That means that we don't experience any new emotional traumas after about the age 8. This may make no sense to you. After all, you probably suffered heartache from breaking up with a first love in your teens or 20s. Or maybe you felt the immense pain of losing your husband when you were 40. Am I really trying to tell you that the pain that you felt from age 8 up until now wasn't real or that it wasn't traumatic? No. What I'm telling you is that the trauma you experienced as a result of losing your husband was, in fact, just a reflection of a prior wound. So when we consider the example of the kind of intense feeling a woman might feel from the loss of her husband today, we may find that when she was four years old, her father left the family. Then we can see that the emotions associated with the loss of her husband are in fact a reflection of the loss of her father in childhood. The loss of her father was the unhealed wound that he has re-manifested in the form of loss for her husband. Her being still hopes to integrate the old unhealed wound. This is an example that clearly shows us why we need to start the completion process with the mantra that if anything hurts when it's pressed, it is because there was already a wound there. I'm going to repeat that. <laughs> if anything hurts when pressed, it is because we already have a wound there. It's so true. This does not mean that you cannot suffer trauma in your adult life. It simply means that that trauma that you are currently experiencing in your adult life often links to an even deeper causal origin. The completion process will work to resolve trauma within you being no matter what age you were when the trauma occurred. For example, it will work to resolve the post-traumatic stress that a veteran experienced as a result of returning home from war. But what we often find while working with that trauma that we think caused our current distress is the real trauma lies far deeper. Saucy. We discover that the trauma we think caused our distress is just a reflection of an even earlier trauma. For example, the powerless feeling of being in the line of fire in war zones could be a reflection of the powerless feeling that a soldier had when he was a child, metaphorically being caught in the line between his parents while they're divorcing. If this is a hard concept to accept, I ask you to suspend judgment for a time and simply try out this process. Let the direct experience of the completion process make up your mind. <laughs> As we commence this process, 
I want you to think of all the uncomfortable emotions today as ropes to link you, your current self, to all of your traumatic memories. When you have a strong emotional reaction to something today, the strong reaction means that your past trauma has been triggered and wants to integrate. We can then use that emotion that is surfacing in real time to find the aspect of yourself that has been rejected and therefore suppressed. Whether it is a personality trait, a belief, a memory, a feeling, by finding it and feeling it, you integrate it back into your present awareness and thus become whole again. This is the underlying premise of the completion process. I'm going to read a little bit more, but I just want to say hello. Thank you guys for being in here with me. Appreciate your time. This is the completion process by Teal Swan. We're on chapter three, making the subconscious conscious. Inner child work. When we become adults, we think that our childhood has ended, but it has not. Our child self remains alive within us. Its perceptions and beliefs affect the way that we think, feel, and act today. When we encountered things in our childhood that were painful, we were stuck in that pain with no knowledge of how to assimilate or heal it. The totality of who we are at this point in time could not move forward. That's how old thoughts, feelings, and experiences froze into our being. Many of us survive and function day to day by ignoring the pain. In some cases, the feelings become so painful that in order to function in all, you reject that part of, reject that part of yourself that first experienced the particular pain. In essence, as children, we buried our own inner selves. It was a coping mechanism that served us well at the time, but stifled that pain can kill us in the end. The pain we hang on to can only be healed and assimilated when we are willing to be brave to turn our attention back towards a child who is frozen in time. We need to listen to what the child has to say and love our inner child in the same way that he or she needed to be loved way back then. So true. <sighs> it's crazy like actually experiencing it and then reading it because I read this before I tried the process and I've done it like three times now and now I like no <sighs> okay each and every one of us regardless of how loving or unloving our upbringing was hold within ourselves the essence of the children we once were one part of us grew up but the other part stayed a child this inner child is a symbol of our emotional selves the adult part of you that grew up despite not getting what it needed as a child it's your adult self who holds the key to healing. Yay! We will always be emotional orphans if we wait for someone else to lovingly parent the undeveloped parts of ourselves. <laughs> Ugh. We will always be powerless if we wait for someone else to come in and rescue the part of us that needs to be rescued. And we will always be unhealed if we are waiting for someone else to take care of those parts of us that need to be cared for. The best way to begin facilitating your own healing is to consciously take care of that child self that is present within you. You need to provide for yourself today whatever you did not receive in the past for others, from others. Inner child work has been a foundation of self-help and psychology for many years. It's one of the most life-transforming techniques, but unknowingly, we have been missing a few crucial components in this technique. 
The completion process takes inner child work to the next level and reveals that it is much more than just a quaint self-help technique. How the human shadow works. Ooh, I love this. What is the human shadow? Let me share a basic explanation. You probably already know about your ego, which is your self-concept. Your ego is the part of the internal you that forms as a kind of separate identity. When you first come into this life, your ego is not yet fully formed, but as you grow up and gradually mature, your ego is formed through your relationships with others. <laughs> Therefore, the majority of your ego develops during the process of socialization. While you're being socialized within your family and your community, you learn the concepts of good and bad, right and wrong, acceptable and unacceptable. More importantly, you learn about the aspects of yourself that are acceptable and unacceptable. It becomes clear to you, even as a young child, that love and reward will come in response to when you act acceptable and that abandonment and punishment will, ar will arise in response to what is unacceptable. As we covered in the early chapters, people naturally develop a survival strategy rejecting and therefore suppressing what we think is unacceptable about ourselves. This causes a split in our consciousness. In essence, we divide ourselves. This is how the real substance of sub subconscious mind is born. We could call the subconscious the shadow because we can't see it clearly and thus we are not aware of it. In the same vein, we could call our conscious side the light because we can see it clearly and we are aware of what is conscious in our lives. The completion process is a shadow part, shadow work process because it's a process that involves the aspect of ourselves that we are not conscious of. Living with internal separation and division is not a natural state for humans. It's actually an unhealed state because the shadow aspects of our inner selves strive to be integrated. Regardless of how much we wish that it would just go away, our shadow rears its head whenever something in our subconscious is brought into awareness by circumstances in our lives. So if our partner does not show up on time, this may trigger a deeply suppressed feeling of abandonment when we weren't even aware of. It's quite possible that we could spend the next 45 minutes flipping out in what seems like a massive overreaction. But as you have learned in the last chapter, it's not drama. It's your true inner feelings. To work with the human shadow is to make the unconscious conscious and make your unacceptable unaccept. Make the unacceptable acceptable. The integration of your unconscious leads to complete and total awareness. It sounds great, and I believe it is a very powerful technique. But, while exploring the human shadow, it's, po it's popular with some spiritual teachers, psychologists, and life coach. This technique is very unpopular with others. Even channels and spiritual guides sometimes disagree on the subject of the human shadow. So I will give you my point of view. Can working with the human shadow work against you? You might have heard two specific arguments against working with the human shadow. The first is, if you focus on your shadow, all you'll get is more shadow. The second is, if you focus on needing to clear yourself of your shadow, all there will be is more shadow to clear. In my opinion, these two arguments come from a very limited and elementary understanding of consciousness itself, 
resistance, and also the law of attraction. If we, if it were true that the positive focus creates a purely positive person, then any person who is petting a puppy or focusing positively and consistently would have a pure energy field around them that is completely clear of any quote-unquote wounds. But this is not the case. Being born extrasensory, I have always been able to see energy fields around the people that I meet. In truth, each human body at its core is an energy field. When I'm observing somebody's energy field, which is sometimes called an aura, that person is focused on something positive, such as petting a puppy. Yes, parts of that person's energy will become lighter. It is if they are allowing more energy in, but there are still other parts of their energy field that remain dark and cloudy. The dark part that appears in the human energy field are called aura tears, rips, or imprints from unhealed trauma. And these are especially prevalent in the emotional body field. No matter how positive someone's focus is, their subconscious contains trauma imprints. These aspects don't just go away with a warm and fuzzy experience like thinking happy thoughts. <laughs> when we are experiencing something traumatic on an emotional level, it works the same way as it does with physical trauma. To use an extreme example, if you are the average person involved in a head-on collision and you end up with a compound fracture, no amount of purely positive focus is going to fuse your bone back together again. If you focus positively, chances are that your positive focus might simply lead you towards the direction of a doctor who can put that bone back together again. <laughs> if you focus positively, chances are... Oh wait, I just said that. It's not a comfortable procedure to have a bone reset. It's a process that demands that you admit that the bone is indeed broken. Have someone set the bone and put a cast on it. Then focus deliberately on creating the healing environment and state for that particular ailment. Consider another scenario. What if you have a compound fracture and you attempt to distract yourself from the fracture? by just thinking positive thoughts. You then are in a mental and emotional tug of war between the aspect of yourself that does have awareness that this is a serious issue that needs conscious attention and the other aspect of yourself that doesn't even want to admit that this is a serious issue that needs conscious attention. What would cause you to decide that the best thing to do is to focus positively when you clearly have a compound fracture that needs medical attention? The answer is to avoid something. Ooh, true. All right. What am I trying to get at here? Is that there are an enormous there is an enormous difference between focusing on something positive for the sake of maintaining fo positive focus and focusing on something positive for the sake of trying to escape to ignore or to get away from something negative consider this honestly what is the result of trying to you are trying to escape from ignore or get away from our compound fracture, it festers. If we survive at all, we are incapable. Oh, we are in. Oh. In. It's a word that I don't know. But she explains it anyway. <laughs> in short, when we try to avoid something unpleasant or painful, the thing that we are trying to avoid gets worse. Right? common sense <laughs> we've just talked about the examples from your physical body but it's the exact same scenario when we face something on an emotional level 
If we suffered an emotional trauma and we reject and therefore suppress it in favor of keeping positive focus, we are using positivity to get away from negativity. The emotional wound does not actually get any better. It will fester. However, if you do focus positively, chances are that your positive focus could lead you to someone who can help you heal and ultimately integrate your emotional wounds. Thank you for the cheers. <laughs> Appreciate you guys. Thank you. I believe that if you find yourself resistant to the idea of working with your own shadow, you are trying to avoid something. And when you realize that you're using positive focus to avoid something negative, it's time to release that resistance to something. You have to turn into the direction of it instead of away from it. Because turning away from it just reinforces your resistance to it. It's a really funny thing. When I first did my um, the completion process all the way through, for the first time, I literally did the completion process on the aspect of me that is afraid to do the completion process. Because I had a lot of resistance. I had a lot of like fear that it wasn't going to work or it wasn't going to like really help me in any way. So I had to kind of get through that first, you know? You can't really go into it if you have already have a lot of resistance towards it. So, yeah. Attracting lemons into your life. When I say, don't think about lemons... You start to think about lemons. And this is what you're doing on a subconscious level by trying to use positive focus to avoid negative emotions. You're basically saying, whatever you do, don't focus on the way you actually feel. Trying not to think about the negative emotions only serves to magnify the way that you are actually feeling until the reflection is so big you can't possibly escape it. It manifests itself in a more aggressive way, hoping that you will come to terms with it and eventually release your resistance to it. So you are already in resistance to your own shadow aspect, and this resistance is why the negative emotion settled into the subconscious in the first place. So what should you do when you are in resistance to something? You should try to release resistance towards that specific thing. We know that it doesn't work to obsessively focus positively on, on it or to try to ignore it. Because that just makes us resist it even further. In our sincere effort to avoid it, we are in essence focusing on it and sending it energy without even being aware that we are actually doing that. The most common turn of events when we repeatedly ignore or deny what is real for us, but it is unwanted by us, is, the, is that it manifests within our physical bodies as an illness or another physical condition that we just can't ignore. It's interesting to note that we are not only that we don't only reject unaccess unacceptable bad things into our subconscious but we also suppress unacceptable good things this is what idolation I idolization that's an interesting word idolization is about idolization is nothing more than the projection of a suppressed positive attribute of one person onto another. So you may admire the reflection you see instead of the source, which is yourself. Seeking awareness. When it comes to suppressed aspects of our being, the first step in shifting from a lower vibration to a higher one is to become aware. When we are dealing with something that we're not consciously aware of, Becoming aware is always the first step towards a vibrational growth. Becoming aware is like the first time you shine a light into a dark closet just to see what's there. Awareness 
in and of itself generates immense relief. We fear our shadow, and that is why we initially resist it. But by becoming aware of it, we come to understand it. But by becoming aware of it, oh, I just said that. We come to understand it. Understanding our shadow is the most effective way to diminish fear, which allows us to feel more grounded and authentic. Positive focus does work, but there is one major exception. Positive focus works on everything except for the things that you are trying to avoid. Avoid. Another way of saying this is that positive focus works every time except when it is used as a tool to enable our resistance. Many of us are excited to discover the power of positive focus because it seems like a get out of jail free card. <laughs> it seems like the magic pill that allows us to escape and avoid all of our unwanted aspects. Unfortunately, because of an incomplete understanding of the law of attraction, many teachers are reinforcing this idea that all it takes to create a perfect life is to just think positive thoughts. However, consider this. If we have big things we are trying to avoid, like it or not, conscious or not, a large part of our consciousness is going to be focused on the past traumas. We're like emotionally crippled. On one level, we know we are hurting really bad, but on another level, we don't want to admit it. We'd rather believe that if our focus is positive enough, we will miraculously, miraculously be put back together again. Here's the flaw in that thinking. The law of attraction, which is governing the law of this universe, <gasps> la 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 la, where did I go, is essentially the law of mirroring. The law of attraction states that whatever, vibra whatever vibrations are contained within you are being matched exactly by experiences in your external world. And, as we have already discussed, like it or not, your shadow aspects are vibrations within you that are attracting experiences into your life to match them. For this to stop happening, the shadows within you must be integrated and healed in order to cease being points of attraction. When talking about the law of attraction, I often use the analogy of a radio dial. Whatever station that your dial is turned on dictates what signal and therefore what radio station you will receive. On an emotional level, this means that you, if you are tuned into joy, you receive joy. But this analogy only works if you see yourself in your entirety as one dial. In reality... You're more like a switchboard made up of multiple dials. The various frequencies that are being received all by these different dials are making up your overall vibration. You have a dial related to every subject in your life. Looking at it this way, my dial relative to relationships could be set on despair. And so I receive relationships that lead me to only heartbreak. Simultaneously, my career could be set to elation. So I receive career opportunities that make me feel elated. And I love my job. If you improve the frequency of the signal being received by just one of these dials, your overall vibration will increase. But to say that the positive focus in any one area of your life will cause positive improvement in all areas of your life is not accurate. Regardless of how much you positively focus on your career or your friends or your body 
you can still have a terrible vibration about romantic relationships. And so, you will start to experience negative things in your romantic life. You may start to think that positive focus doesn't even work. But as I have just described, it's not the whole story. Working on your shadow helps you to let go. Now let me explain the second most common misconception about working with the human shadow and the reason many people are discouraged from doing it. It's based on the idea that if they focus on their shadow, that the focus will create more of the same, right? Because like attracts like. The things you put your time and energy into, you get more of. Makes sense on a certain limited perspective. <laughs> it's based on the idea that if you focus on the shadow, it will create more of the same. Thus, there will always be more shadow and more work to do on the shadow. This is not accurate, and here is why. If we acknowledge that a person is made of universal energy in a state of wholeness, where she comes into this life, you could imagine that the pure energy is a light, much like our sun. Throughout this person's life, as she develops and experiences trauma, she doesn't gain darkness. The light within her doesn't go away, but rather, her light is obscured. So when you work with your shadow, you will notice that it, as, it is as if you have wiped dusty film off of a window. You don't need to work at creating more light because once the dusty film is wiped off the window, light will naturally stream back into the room. You have removed what was obscuring the light. Alternatively, Alternatively, you could view your subconscious aspects as anchors that are holding you under water. If you turned into the direction of the anchor and unhooked yourself from it, you wouldn't need to swim towards the surface. You would naturally float upwards. This is what your vibration does when you do shadow work. It asks. It asks. It naturally increases your vibration because the things that were decreasing it reintegrated and there is no longer anything to weigh down your vibration. So cool. So cool. Dealing with a rush of emotions. People who have dedicated some aspects of their personal practice to exploring their shadow know from experience that over time, less and less work on their shadow really needs to be done because they become more and more integrated. But I can see why some people are confused and might think the exact opposite. I believe that this is because a great many of people who are against working on the human shadow have experienced what I call an emotional healing crisis. When they first give themselves permission to open and close the closet of their subconscious, their subconscious comes rushing out. If you're experiencing an emotional he healing crisis, it's tempting to think that your life has gotten much worse since you started exploring your own shadow. But this is a purge. And ironically, this is the point that most people start stop working on their shadow and turn back towards what they came from. They are passing through the eye of the storm. If they would just keep going instead of turning back, they would reintegrate those aspects and quite likely attain the enlightening experience. They would feel freedom and wholeness and peace for the very first time. This is what I want for you, for everyone who is ready to be whole again. So now you can see why it is so important to turn around and face your fears. When you face your fears, there is no longer any power over you. You are no longer resisting the unwanted by running away from it. 
Instead, you are shifting into a state of allowance and acceptance. By doing this, the old aspects of self, which were based on old traumas, can't hurt you or haunt you anymore. <laughs> like a ghost, your shadow will follow you to the ends of the earth, begging for the light of consciousness to turn towards it. No amount of positive focus will make it disappear. Long story short, focusing on the shadow doesn't create more shadow because shadow that is exposed to the light of consciousness ceases to even be shadow. Now that you understand why I feel so strongly about the inner child work and exploring the human shadow and how important these processes are, there are a few more concepts to review before we proceed to the completion process. Specifically, I will explain to you your physical body, your feeling body, and the concept of time related to our lives and to the process of reintegration. And that's for next week. <laughs> cool, cool. Awesome. I loved that. What a good, it's an awesome chapter. Till next time. Loved it. Thank you guys for being here with me while we read and hang out. I love that one, right? It was good. <laughs> Hello. Thank you guys all for being in here. Appreciate your company. I hope you liked that chapter. Uh, making the unconscious conscious. Very, very important. I feel like a lot of people go their whole lives making a lot of decisions and taking all kinds of actions from a very unconscious they don't even really know why they're doing it they just know that they're doing it because that's what they want to do in the time and they never really look deep into themselves and ask okay why is it that I feel the urge to proceed and communicate in this way and that's when you kind of feel like in your life you need to try to control external circumstances so much is because you don't have any control of your internal your internal world and so it seems like the only thing you can do is just kind of try to manipulate external circumstances but then once you really go inwards and find the things in yourself that don't feel safe and figure out why and then provide for yourself the things that you felt like you could actually never attain but you can once you've attained those things and you've given it back to yourself you finally can experience life from a very you're not getting triggered all the time by things other people say or getting upset about like the smallest of things you just use people can like try to ruffle your feathers and you're just kind of like hmm. You can't hurt me, bro, because, like, my internal world is so at peace regardless of what you do. Do you, boo? Because either way, I'm I'm good. My, my internal sea is calm, right? So, yeah. Definitely something to do. Absolutely. And if you are listening to this and you're wondering, okay, I want to do the completion process. Where the heck do I do that? I don't feel like doing it by myself. Um... If you go onto Teal Swan's website, uh, you can, I think when you first click on it, and there will be something that says do the, doing the completion process with a licensed practitioner. If you click on that, you'll see a huge list of different practitioners, people who are literally trained and have become certified to do exactly that. It's therapy, basically, and it's amazing. It will change your life. I was, like, so miserable just, like, a couple of weeks ago. And I knew it was because I needed to start, you know, working on my shadow and getting to the bottom of some not so helpful beliefs that I developed in my childhood. And yeah, it's literally only been a couple of weeks and I've done it, what, three times? And I feel completely different. I feel like a happy, excited child about life. And I know there's always more work to do, but 
it gets easier and actually like a little bit of fun once you get the hang of it it's kind of fun when you get triggered you're like ah first there's like that initial oh this hurts but then you're like if I go into this feeling into this pain underneath it is a core memory that if I just give it loving attention the one thing that that little child in me did not receive and I give it then this trigger is going to go away and it will, you know, remove the dusty film from the window. And it'll be so beautiful to look through that window now. So yeah, I'm going off on a tangent. Yeah, if you want to do the completion process with a practitioner, then you can go onto Teal Swan's website. Highly recommend. <laughs> Alright, so yeah, that was chapter three. And next week sunday same time we're going to be getting into chapter four and i hope to see you there thank you for watching i am mystical mckay and i'll see you next time Bye bye oh actually if you feel up to it tomorrow morning i'm going to be doing my first ever meditation twitch live i don't know how it's gonna go but i'm gonna try uh seven a.m. Arizona time, which usually means 9 a.m. Central time. So if you'd like to join me, I don't really know what I'm going to do. Probably just breath work type stuff for a first try. So, yeah, kind of fun. I hope to see you there. If not, then see you some other time. Okay? Bye. Love you. <laughs>